So I spent 26 years at CIA, um, and I only had to go to confession a couple times. Uh, <laughs> it had nothing really to do with intelligence, but it's my failings, not anything intelligence related. So, our topic is intelligence and Christian ethics. Well, how about the Nats? <laughs> I'm not trying to evade the question, it's just that I don't think I have any particularly brilliant insights for you. In intelligence, we're all about bottom lines, you know, the bottom line up front. Uh, we don't believe in the mystery and all style of writing, you know, whatever you come to the conclusion at the end. It's very difficult to teach my students this, too. But you start with your conclusion and, uh, and then justify it. So I have a, a few bottom line conclusions that you can judge, and then if, if they're not adequate, you can take a break early. The first is that intelligence officers, whether they are Christians or people of any faith or not, all know in their gut that this is a fallen world. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Another bottom line is that to the question whether a believing, practicing, professing Christian can be in U.S. intelligence and serve a career, I, I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Okay, that's a bottom line. Uh, I'm a deacon of the Orthodox Church, and in fact, I thought about wearing my cassock just to make a point, uh, but I thought that's make people un uncomfortable. The other uh, bottom line is that we have to remember what intelligence is. Intelligence is the is secret state activity to understand or influence foreign entities. And in our uh, intelligence studies program at the Catholic University of America, we parse that pretty closely. Uh, secret state activity to understand or influence foreign entities. And there are, there are potential uh, ethical concerns um, in every part of that. And let me break it down further, another, another bottom line. The way we teach about intelligence there is that it comprises five basic elements. Four classic ones and one element that's necessary because we serve a great democracy. And that's collection, most basic intelligence activity, and all its manifestations, technical and human collection. Analysis, making sense of what is collected. Counterintelligence, trying to prevent the bad guys, our adversaries, from learning about us and national, U.S. national secrets. Covert action, we're getting more problematic as we go down the line here. Covert action, which is the implementation of foreign policy in such a way that the hand of the United States is not apparent or can be denied. And then finally, the, the fifth one that is absolutely necessary because of our democracy, and I know your previous speaker spoke uh, of uh, Christianity and democracy, is that we need accountability. Because to do these things, to do the collection, to do the analysis, to do counterintelligence and covert action, there are resources and um, there is power at work that needs to be held accountable. Accountable to our democracy, to the Constitution, to our elected leaders, uh, through various means of oversight, and ultimately to the American people who are sovereign. Now, I set my career, uh, well, I started as an analyst and, and uh, rose to be a manager of analysts. Uh, I edited the President's Daily Brief for three stress-filled years. And so I'm going to start with analysis. Analysis is fairly easy to, uh, I won't say dispense with, but to, to cover in terms of well, what ethical challenges are there. Well, it's the normal one that you would find in any line of work, you should be good at what you do, and try hard. You have a moral obligation to give your employer um, what you're supposed to do, right? And the worker deserves his wages. But beyond that, intelligence analysis does raise some questions, because very often the analysis runs counter to what the ultimate customer, the policymaker, wants. And so there are temptations to color the analysis, to not uh, be as objective as one ought to be to match the policymaker's expectations. And that is a, in the anal analytical world, that's, I think that's, that's a sin. Uh, arguably, it's a 
sin in the theological world as well. What else can I say about analysis? Um, it's important for analysts to know that we live in this fallen world and we are affected by it. So we have certain human shortcomings. We are fallible, unorthodox. We don't believe in the infallibility of anyone. So analysts can be prey to certain cognitive mindsets that lead to a less objective product. Uh, we've, uh, we, we study the issue, special issue of mirror imaging when if we are observing a foreign entity, an advers potential adversary, and trying to figure out what they're up to, mirror imaging is as it suggests. You look in the mirror, there's a great mirror back there, and you see yourself. You assume that these foreigners who come from different cultural contexts that you ought to know about, your moral obligation to learn about them. More or less think like we do. More or less have the same assumptions that we do. And that is deadly. That leads to famous mistakes, like a CIA telling President Kennedy in September of uh, 1962 that, you know, the Soviets could put missiles in Cuba, but they don't think they will because they must realize it's not in their interest. Well, that's not how Khrushchev was thinking. The classic case of mirror imaging. Another one is uh, confirmation bias, which is all too prevalent both in intelligence and in uh, journalism and in education, where you seek and cherry pick the evidence that helps you get, uh, helps justify the conclusion you've already come to. That's a brief sin. Uh, there are other mindsets like continuity bias. It's always been this way. You know, the Shah has always been able to handle the opposition in Iran. We think he's going to be able to do it again, which works until it doesn't. None of these are sins, really. But we have to be aware that they exist. Again, we have a moral obligation to, un to be within ourselves, to understand our own limitations. And above all, and I'll get out of the analysis, above all, there is a definite need for humility, good old-fashioned Christian humility. It is the be-all and end-all, I think, of so many things, including intelligence analysis. That ability to look at your you know, wonderful analysis that you've worked so hard at and consider the possibility that you may be wrong. You know, maybe Saddam Hussein really doesn't have weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it was a lack of humility that has led CIA I know, to uh, analytic failures. So moving along in the uh, along the elements, I tell my students that you know this isn't the, the periodic table of elements. In, in, in my world, there are only five. So we move on. Uh, I started with analysis, but I have to step back to what happens before the analysis is the collection, and this is a whole world of potential ethical challenges, technical and human. On the human side, we are we. I keep saying we, even though it's been three years since I was uh, part of CIA, and I'm not, not employed now, okay? <coughs> Students sometimes ask, you know, I'm not, not here to recruit or to spy. <laughs> However, if you are interested in the career, I can help. Um, a uh, CIA officer who is in charge of his, his, his or her basic function is to recruit human sources, assets. Spies, if you will, or agents. Uh, that officer is a case officer. He or she is handling a specific case. And what they do is they, in the course of their work, which is undercover, and cover is a lie. We talk about whether or not lying uh, is, is ever justified. Uh, there are a couple schools of thought on that. Um, that case officer, in the course of his or her work, let's say, undercover, uh, working in an embassy somewhere, is to spot interesting foreigners, those foreigners that might have privileged access to information of national security interests of the United States. If they spot such an individual, then working with headquarters, we assess that individual, trying to find out as much as we can about that individual, because eventually we want to create a relationship with that individual. And then the case officer may find out that this uh, 
uh, interesting uh, Iranian in the, on, in the diplomatic circuit in a particular capital. I'm not going to mention any names in case I'm correct. Um, maybe this particular uh, Iranian seems to know something about their missile program. Uh, he plays tennis at the, you know, where all the diplomats play tennis. Well, uh, you're not a bad tennis player, you're going to go and sort of accidentally on purpose bump into this person, exchange cards, develop a relationship. If this sounds exploitative, it is. <laughs> um, if you have a problem with it, please don't go into intelligence. Uh, because this, this is something where I tell my students that um, when we talk about understanding and influencing foreign entities and the things we do to, to do that on behalf of U.S. national security, the only way to justify much of this is that our cause is better than the other guys. It comes down to that. And if you don't believe that, go do something else, please. Um, there's a lot we can talk about, uh, more about human intelligence uh, in that what they call the recruitment acquisition cycle of spotting, assessing, developing, and then there's the recruitment. There's the actual where the, the, the scales come off the eyes and everybody understands what's going on. You've developed a relationship, you've manipulated that relationship to the point where you are confident that you're going to pitch this person and that person will say yes. It's sort of like asking someone to marry you, okay, you take notes on this. You spot somebody who looks interesting, you learn all about that person, right? you Google searches, and then you kind of accidentally bump into that person, and develop a relationship, and it all works out, and you're popping a question, right? As in love, you want to know the answer to the question before you pop it. You want to be pretty sure that uh, things have gone on the right track. And of course, being fallible, we make mistakes, both in love and in intelligence, in human, human intelligence. Um, but then once the relationship, and sometimes in both cases, the answer is, I thought you never asked. Um, and some very productive, getting away from the world of love, uh, very productive and long-lasting intelligence relationships have been developed, some of them lasting decades, at very high levels. And we are, we in U.S. intelligence are great, getting great information that we can use now to inform the policymakers so they can make better decisions. That's the understanding part of it. Uh, don't want to go into the... Uh, the, the, the maze of uh, issues regarding technical intelligence, we can do that Q&A. Um, but moving on to, uh, I'll, and I'll leave aside covert uh, counterintelligence for now, we'll go straight to covert action. Covert action, again, the implementation of a foreign policy initiative authorized by the president, there's a legal requirement, the president has to sign a document, and I find that this is necessary for national security in the United States, and that's transmitted to Congress. So in just war, we call that proper authority, right? But we're actually be divided into one of two general categories. Uh, you could call it the soft covert action and the hard covert action, or soft uh, hearts and minds, trying to capture hearts and minds, influence opinions, or the bombs and bullets, the implementation of violence, either directly or through proxies. Um, we can go into a whole range of the di the different examples of that. Uh, I was a CIA historian, I could talk forever about this stuff. But it seems to me that those uh, very thoughtful writers who have uh, applied just war doctrine to the proposal and implementation of covert action are right on the money. And I think, from my understanding of covert action deliber deliberations and proposals, but those questions are asked. Is this being done under proper authority? Is it the last resort? Because it's risky. We want to make sure that other means uh, are, are unsuitable for, let's say, a, a government that we don't like is oppressing its people and is supporting an insurgency in a neighboring country that we, whose government we do like. Well, we're going to be uh, helping the government that we do like, deal with its insurgency. This is a part of the paramilitary side of covert actions. And then we might support an insurgency against the government we do like. And then this exactly happened in Central America in the 1980s. 
with the CI support for that contract. Um, in this and in all such activities that have potential ethical challenges, usually the question is how far do you go? How far do you go to collect information? How far do you go uh, in implementing a covert action? Uh, I mentioned just war, you know, again, proper authority, last resort. Right? Are the means proportional to the, the goal? It has to be a clearly uh, articulated goal that does not, that, that will bring peace back to this area and, and, and further social justice. All those things really should be, and I think are, for the most part, asked before covert action is launched. And of course, Congress is in, informed in almost all cases, there are exceptions. So, uh, I don't know how. How much longer do you want me to talk? We can go to questions. Um, we'll go to that five minutes. Oh, sure. What do you think? When it comes to counterintelligence, and in this, uh, you know, again, the question is how, how far do we go in uh, trying to find the, the spies among us? Uh, there is a, a recognized uh, you know, right of privacy, certainly a desire for privacy by people, and uh, that seems to be uh, violated when uh, there's suspicion that there's a spy among us, one of us who has sworn an oath to the Constitution, as we all do, is now violating that oath by working for a foreign entity, the government, maybe a foreign terrorist group. And uh, so that, there, that becomes an issue. Um, in the recent war on terror, recent, it's going on still, as of this week, uh, there was an unfortunate uh, episode, or series of episodes, uh, involving the elicitation of information from terrorist suspects in custody who weren't talking. They were, it was judged that they had information, and how do we go about getting them, getting that information? Well, and, and uh, it was authorized by the administration, rightly or wrongly, and however you think about it. The enhanced interrogation techniques, the EITs, uh, were authorized uh, by the administration, and whatever Congress tells you, they were briefed in the name to Congress. Yes, there were abuses, and uh, that was very unfortunate. Um, but to the, the two questions you have to ask, uh, were they effective and were they ethical? Um, intelligence professionals will tell you that they worked, you know, despite what the Senate report said, that they, they will tell you that they worked. We, we learned unique information that led us to other terrorists and plots. As far as whether they were ethical enough, they were certainly legal at the time. Three times CIA made sure they got it in writing from the Justice Department. Um, it was still troubling to some. In fact, there was an internal complaint against it that went to the Inspector General, and the whole thing unraveled as a result. In a sense, the system worked. Uh, but that question whether that they were ethical or not, I mean, everybody's got an opinion, but that doesn't really belong to intelligence. Um, if people have ethical concerns, they don't have to be involved. They can raise it, as somebody did. Um, we, don't, we don't check our ethical concerns at the door when we go to work. Um, getting back to human intelligence, it occurs to me that uh, we run a uh, a seminar called Issues in Contemporary U.S. Intelligence in which I, I post scenarios to the, uh, to the students. So you're a case officer and you are working an asset who's giving us great information. This asset is a North Korean scientist who's giving us the keys to the kingdom about the North Korean missile program and he knows a lot about the nuclear program as well. This is great. But he wants certain things. How far are we going to go? give him uh, what he wants so that we can get from him what, what we want from him. You know, will we provide him with pornography? Will we provide him with a prostitute? You know, and, and you can, you can get, you know, provide him with drugs. I'm not going to give you the, the, the answer. I mean, I'm not sure there is an answer. It depends. I think the practical answer is it depends. So um, we run these scenarios, they're, they're, um, they're usually by design fraught with ethical concerns. And the most important thing 
I think is to, is to ask the right questions. Uh, ask the right questions. So I think with that, I will stop. And I'm happy to take questions. I think we have a little more time than I anticipated here. And I'm going to take my coat off because this is a warm room. <laughs> Johnson from Regent University. You mentioned briefly the idea of covers. I just wanted to sure. get your thoughts on the ethics behind lines to protect other information. Well, despite my introduction, I, I'm not an expert on Christian ethics. Uh, I know something about intelligence, and I do know something about Christianity. It's kind of required. Um, <laughs> but in terms of my understanding of the Western intellectual tradition, is that there you have two schools of thought about whether a line is covered. Being, Undercover. Everybody knows what being undercover is, right? You are presenting yourself as something that you're not. And that can have a lot of layers, that can be very complex, it can be very simple. When I was an analyst and I traveled abroad, I was under uh, nominal cover. It wasn't backstopped very much, and in this digital age it probably wouldn't work. But um, usually it was under official cover. I was working for another U.S. government agency. Once it was commercial cover, which was very strange. Was, uh, a senior researcher at a think tank that did not exist. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're undercover, as I was temporarily, or for some operations officers, basically for their entire careers, they are presenting themselves as something that they're not. And uh, so the, the issue is, is that kind of lying permissible? And, you know, if you consult Immanuel Kant, Thomas Aquinas, John Calvin, and the answer seems to be no. It's never, you know, the, 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 it uh, lying uh, offends the word of God, the logos. Uh, we uh, must not lie because we're all children of God and we have this dignity and all that. And then you have another tradition, which is, you know, thinking of Reinhold Niebuhr and St. John Chrysostom, Eastern Orthodox, um, who said, yeah. Niebuhr would say, when the Nazi comes to your door, your door you lie to the Nazi about, you know, you have, you have Jews hiding in your basement. You lie to him. That's where justice is done. He doesn't deserve the truth. He has removed himself from deserving the truth. St. John Chrysostom, in one of his sermons, praises the divine deception of Rahab, the prostitute. Uh, you know that story. Uh, you know, the... She's called before the king of Jericho, and, and he says, where are the Hebrew spies? We know you met with them, which indicates he's got a good kind of intelligence service. <laughs> and she says, oh, yeah, they came, and they went that away. And she's hiding them. She lied. And again, St. John Chrysostom said, this is a divine deception. It, it furthered the will of God. Now, I'm not going to tell you that when I lied to the United uh, uh, desk clerk, uh, about what I was doing in a particular country, using my cover, uh, that I was doing the will of God. But I think there's, there is a holistic view of cover that in order for us to do our jobs in U.S. intelligence, we have to accept some of these things. Um, otherwise, otherwise uh, we will not be able in general to do our jobs, which is to, protect, to help protect the country. So a very good uh, question about cover. Um, it's not for everyone, and it's stressful, and believe me, uh, if um, CI officers undercover could not be undercover, they prefer not to. It's, it complicates everything from uh, doctor's appointments to getting a mortgage. You know, everything. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, for all who live at Liberty University, okay. I'm standing on the sites so and everyone's looking at my back. Um, but as a Government students studying intelligence and then also students studying psychology. I'm really interested in how um, intelligence agencies overall kind of focus on keeping those ethics and those morals to their um, individuals like, important and relevant to conversations. Mm -hmm. um, as well as the idea of like, like you're saying with CIs being undercover for so long, like that impacts a person's psyche kind of more than the initial of the moral or the ethical aspects of a person. Mm -hmm. and so as someone who's obviously never been invited to look into the CIA or any intelligence agency, are there organizations inside those departments that are furthering 
you know, the psychology of their people and then the ethics to like, keep that relevant to conversation? Or yeah. is that kind of more of a new age kind of thing where everyone wants to be more interested in what's going on? No, we have uh, at CIA there are a lot of counselors. I mean, the, the general psychological health of the workforce is very important to CIA uh, because if we have unhappy people, then they might decide to work for another foreign government, and, and that would be bad. There have been uh, a few very unfortunate cases, and uh, and this gets into the psychology of giving up all your data, your financial data, so they can monitor you. Your every keystroke is monitored. Uh, your print queue is monitored, what's on your screen uh, is subject, it, it's all subject to monitoring. In fact, as a CIA historian, which made me interested in everything, uh, I was, uh, I once had to go talk to the counterintelligence people because um, I was printing off too many things. Why are you doing this? Because I'm a CIA historian and I'm interested in everything. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they bought that, I, you know, I spent no time in jail. Um, but they did want to know. Um, to the more specific case of um, whether it's stressful, yes, it is stressful, and, and there are, there's a lot of training involved um, in how to live undercover. There are uh, training modules regarding the ethics of the workplace. You know, normal things like you know you don't misuse government credit cards. You know, you don't use the internet for pornography and that sort of thing. Um, and then the specific cases where. Okay, you're dealing with a foreign asset, somebody we've recruited, and he or she wants this. Are we going to give it to them? There, there are guidances about that. So it's you know, one is not alone when one works uh, in the intelligence uh, services. Uh, at CIA, it's very much a community. Sometimes a very closed community. I met my wife there. You know, we're a CIA family, um, and that's worked out. So that's good. Uh, and when you leave, it's a little traumatic, and they have counseling when you leave. I, I can tell you, it was only three years ago. They called it leaving the monastery. And it's like, well, that is fine. You know, you're out there in, in the world. So they, they, they spend a lot, they invest a lot into uh, preparing you for these things. Uh, specific, uh, there are other specific programs for people coming back from war zones. You know, we have people in the, in the war zones which are drawn in, of course. But uh, for years, we have people coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq who had seen some really nasty stuff. And so they need to go through that. The counterterrorism analysts who review these terrible videos that ISIS made. I don't know if you remember this a few years ago, but ISIS was, you know, quite publicly and graphically cutting the heads off of people. And uh, that all needed to be reviewed by somebody. In fact, um, through analysis of the veins on one of their, one of these guys, Jihadi John, is from Britain. Uh, they were able to identify who this guy was, and he died in a drone strike in 2014. So, eye for an eye, I guess. Um, so yeah, and but th these people, they need counseling too. So, there is an infrastructure for this, for what you're asking. Very much. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Aiden McKenna from Eaton College. Um, so you've talked a lot about ethics, obviously, because that's your topic. Uh -huh. um, so are there any common threads of ethical concerns that you've seen that would transcend that closed community or monastery? Um, and after answering that question, are there any specific passages or books like the wisdom literature that have really um, helped you and people that you know who are Christians in those types of situations? to navigate ethical concerns or to deal with ramifications of actions that they've taken? Wow, that's a heavy question. Um, in terms of scripture, um, I think I've relied on the Sermon on the Mount and also the Psalms. Again, uh, reminding us that we are called to be perfect, but we live in a very imperfect world and have to deal with it on its own terms. And, um, and I'm trying to remember the first part of your question, if you can restate that. So just common threads of ethical concerns right. across professions. Um, no, I, I think it's pretty consistent. What's interesting now, of course, is that what's in the news is that somebody in the intelligence community, uh, the intelligence community has, is the object of accountability, so oversight, because of the resources and the power that intelligence has. 
So this is a very unusual situation where you have somebody acting as an oversight mechanism against the executive branch, against the president. This memorandum by this IC whistleblower talking about uh, his concerns or her concerns, as we still don't know, uh, that the president abused his authority in, uh, in negotiating with Ukraine and providing aid to Ukraine, uh, abused uh, his authority by getting a foreign country to investigate a political rival. Um, that's pretty cross-cutting, and what I was struck with by reading the memo, which was revealed, even though the identity of the whistleblower has not been revealed, uh, is that what a, what a good piece of analytic work it was. I, I, I was kind of proud. I understood this person was from the Director of Intelligence, uh, at uh, CIA, uh, so I would know this person's training and it, kind of his mindset, and he really laid it out in an analytical way, uh, bottom line up front, I'm concerned, and expresses concerns, and then the evidence. And then distinguishing between the evidence he knew personally and the evidence he got from other people, reliable sources that he trusted, and he felt that just the weight of that meant that uh, came together uh, and, and really required him because of his concerns about ethics, to um, to go through the, <clears throat> the legal process of writing a, a whistleblower report. So that's the most recent example, and it's an unusual example. And, and I tell you, intelligence does not want to be in this position. In a sense, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the person for standing up and doing what I think is the right thing. Whatever you think about the merits of the case, it, it, it certainly falls within the boundaries of, um, of propriety. Um, John McLaughlin, the, the former acting director of CIA, was asked about this uh, just this last week. He was at a forum much like this at George Mason University, uh, asked about whether this will this will uh, make concerns about the so-called deep state. Uh, <clears throat> it'll exacerbate those concerns. It'll prove the case that there's this cabal of self-interested uh, people in intelligence. There is no deep state. Because um, in 26 years I must have missed it. I missed it. I made, I'm not too good on the uptake, my wife will tell you, but um, it, it, no, it's not there. Uh, but, but McLaughlin kind of, he, he wanted to play around with it. He said, well, if that's a deep state, thank God for the deep state. You know, somebody acted with, out of an ethical conscience, conscience uh, to do something risky. He, he or she knew it would be risky, following the rules and, uh, and presenting it in a very analytic and objective way. Because for all of intelli the problems of intelligence, and there are many problems of intelligence against, again, nobody's infallible. The intelligence community is institutionally committed to objectivity and analysis based on facts. And, uh, and I think that was shown by this person's uh, rather courageous um, action. Okay. Our next speaker is not here yet, so if you have a few more sure. stories to share. Sure. <laughs> I'll tell you, the one time I, I went to have a confession, I felt because uh, I don't think I'm breaking any seal here. Um, it was after the Bin Laden raid. Uh, as you know, uh, CIA and other agencies had determined that there was an unusual com compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Uh, it was discovered through a variety of means, very cool means, as a taxpayer. I was really happy. <laughs> um, but there was no direct evidence that Bin Laden was there. It, and everybody wanted him to be there. And, and, and again, analysts are thinking, okay, I, I can't engage in confirmation bias. What else could this be? But we never ruled out that it was anything else, uh, and we, we, we never ruled out that it, that it, it might be a Bin Laden hideout. And so the, the next few months, they continued to plan for an action, uh, collect more information, which never re resulted in any positive evidence that Bin Laden was there. Uh, but the circumstances seemed that you know, it was there. And then people were asked to uh, give their Confidence levels. How confident are you, given all the information that we have, the inferential information? That we have, how confident are you that he is actually there? And people would 
range from 40% to 99%. And it was, it was an interesting exercise. And eventually, as you know, um, having looked at all the various courses of action, um, the Obama administration decided to send uh, the U.S. Special Forces uh, by a helicopter um, to kill bin Laden. I mean, that was the mission, to kill bin Laden. And, uh, I mean, as Admiral McRaven put it, if we, if we catch him coming out of the shower, start naked, yeah, okay, we'll arrest him. But otherwise, i got to assume he's got a suicide vest. And for force protection, we're, we will kill him. And uh, as you know, that, that happened. But it wasn't without it, uh, its uh, problems. Um, and I was, uh, I was a little distressed that in the course of it, uh, uh, there were... I, you know, the, the degree of innocence and culpability is debatable. Uh, there were two brothers who were harboring bin Laden, knowing very well who he was. They died. And their wives were there, and one of the wives died. She actually threw herself in front of her husband as he was engaged in a firefight with, with the U.S. Special Forces. And she regrettably died. They tried to save her. And I was, uh, I was kind of distressed by that. Um, but anyway... Um, that's the only time an intelligence-related episode uh, caused me to go to confession. And I just wanted to talk things over with my priest. Okay, sir. Um, James Nybrick from Liberty University. Okay. So I had a question um, in sort of uh, dealing with sort of the Fourth Amendment where people have reasonable expectation of privacy and sort mm -hmm. of the intersection between you know, although CIA does a lot of work mostly on foreign countries, mm -hmm. like how, how um, you balance these privacy interests and like expectations of privacy with, you know, intelligence work okay. and, their, and you know, constitutional rights dealing with that sort of problem. Excellent question. Um, I think the best answer was given by um, retired General Michael Hayden, former CIA director, former director of the National Security Agency. He said, in our world, you were either covered by the Fourth Amendment in which case, you know, we have to go through processes. Or you're not, in which case, game on. Right? Um, those of you who are foreign students, sorry. <laughs> um, but basically, the only concern about collection comes when we're talking about a U.S. person, a U.S. citizen, or a person with a green card who's here, a legal resident. Um, and then there are, uh, there are real concerns, you know, if, if there's a foreign conversation that we intercept, that the intelligence community intercepts, between some a foreigner who's in a foreign country and an American citizen, and that the content of that conversation is of some interest, it might be alerting, it might be a warning for, well, you know, we have to handle that a different way. It usually involves a, a warrant, unless the president has an unwarranted program going. But those, all those are over now, um, so it complicates things. It's still doable. Uh, the intelligence co community would prefer to collect more rather than less, uh, but that's why we have that accountability piece. We have to have the, uh, vehicles of oversight, not just the executive, not just the uh, legislative branch. There's a judicial piece of that. And, and the public also has a, has a role. Okay, and I think we're ready to go. All right, thank you.